It seems like every other day there's another doomsday report getting headlines or being featured in some documentary online, sensational news that generates you know, a lot of clicks and keeps cable news afloat. Well, as you arrive uh, with me now here at Ezekiel chapter 4, Ezekiel's not making up some kind of doomsday announcement to scare his nation. He is simply telling them the truth. Now, he's preaching to exiled Jewish people living in Babylon. They think Jerusalem is not going to be completely destroyed. They think they're going to return home in the near future. And frankly, that's because they don't want to admit that their exile is God's judgment on them for their idolatry. So with that in mind, here in chapter 4, the Lord tells Ezekiel to preach some sermons that are going to show them Jerusalem is not their hope. God is. These are what you could call frankly, silent sermons, because it isn't what Ezekiel says. It's what Ezekiel does that delivers the meaning or this message to the hearts of the people. First of all, the Lord tells him here in verse 1, take a brick and lay it before you and engrave on it a city, even Jerusalem. In other words, the brick represents Jerusalem. Ezekiel is then told to construct tiny model ladders and battering rams and surround this this brick with with little enemy campgrounds. It it frankly looks like the prophet's playing a child's game with construction toys and, and building blocks. But this message, a silent message, has this very clear object lesson. Jerusalem is besieged. Jerusalem is about to fall. Now Ezekiel's told here in verse 4 to lie down on his left side for 390 days. Well, that represents the number of years of punishment for Israel's tribes. Then in verse 6, he's told here to, to lie on his right side for 40 days, and that represents the number of years that Judah's tribes are going to suffer. Now, now he's to do this for several hours each day, not 24 hours a day. And and we know that because he's told to get up and and, and bake bread every day, which he does. What particular periods of time these numbers refer to is unclear, but they directly relate to the extent of disobedience in both Israel and Judah. Now, if this isn't strange enough to preach a silent sermon— lying down, Ezekiel is told here in chapter 5 and verse 1 to start shaving with a sword. I can't imagine that. But God says to him, take a sharp sword, use it as a barber's razor, and pass it over your head and your beard. Then take balances for weighing and divide the hair. A third part you shall burn in the fire in the midst of the city. A third part you shall take and strike with a sword, and a third part you shall scatter in the wind. (laughs) This haircut and the shave must have gotten a lot of attention, but the Lord effectively lets the exiles hear what he's telling the people who remain in Judah. Here it is in verse 12. A third part of you shall die of pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. A third part shall fall by the sword all around you, and a third part I will scatter to all the winds, and will unsheathe the sword after them. Now, I've heard a lot of doomsday messages in my day, but nothing like this one. Judah's idolatry and immorality represented by Jerusalem, well, they're going to be judged through famine, disease, and bloodshed. The exiles living in Babylon are not going to have any any city left to return to. Now, here in chapter 6, the Lord gives Ezekiel a message to be spoken. He's he's to be like a watchman crying out from his post on the city wall, warning of the coming judgment of God because of idolatry. The Lord speaks to the exiles through Ezekiel about those 
who remain rebellious back there in Jerusalem here now in verse 3. I will destroy your high places, your altars shall become desolate, and your incense altars shall be broken, and I will cast down your slain before your idols. Now, this severe warning to the exiles is intended by God to move them toward repentance. And that's why it includes an invitation to repent. He says here in verse 9, they, that is the repentant ones, will be loathsome in their own sight for the evils they have committed for all their abominations. In other words, some of them are indeed going to repent and turn back to God. Now, if you think that the Lord just wants to punish people for idolatry, you know, the Lord just wants to make people suffer for choosing immorality, then you've missed God's ultimate goal. Over and over again, the Lord makes it known that he wants his people to follow him. He loves them. He knows that he alone is their faithful creator God. He alone is the Lord of the universe. So back here in verse 7, you read this. You shall know that I am the Lord, verse 10, and they shall know that I am the Lord, verse 13, and you shall know that I am the Lord. See, this valley of suffering is going to lead the repentant Jewish people to a fresh vision of God's sovereignty. So here in chapter 7, Ezekiel is delivering, you know, all the horrific uh, details of famine and cannibalism and murder and betrayal. This is quite a doomsday message. But it isn't designed to create chaos or panic. It's designed to awaken their consciences and turn them back to the Lord. In fact, Ezekiel says here in verse 6 of chapter 7, the end has come. Your doom has come to you. The day is near. I will soon pour out my wrath upon you and judge you according to your ways, and I will punish you for all your abominations. Yes, doomsday is coming for Jerusalem, but don't miss the ultimate reason for it all. Verse 9, then you, you exiles, will know that I am the Lord. See, God's judgment has a unique way of revealing who he is. He isn't just a God of love. He's also a God of justice and holiness and he will judge sin. Listen, when we understand who he is, we can run to him for mercy and forgiveness, and we can say with these exiles, I believe that you are indeed the Lord. Now, unfortunately, almost all of these exiles scoff at Ezekiel. Frankly, they think he's, he's a bit out of his mind. He's just a wacky doomsday prophet. But his doomsday message is going to come to pass. The exiles will have no city to which they can return. Listen, beloved, these exiles who are defying God and hoping in Jerusalem, they are effectively putting their hope in the Titanic. Well, let me tell you, the Titanic is heading for a collision. The priests and the elders and the leaders who are urging them to keep hoping in, in Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem's survival, their return to Jerusalem, they're actually keeping the exiles from seeing their need to repent. They're, they're just helping the exiles adjust their chairs on the deck of the Titanic. And in the end, when Jerusalem falls, well, God says here in verse 27, they shall know that I am the Lord. Now, what does this doomsday message say to us today? Well, for one thing, let's remember that the kingdoms of this world are temporary. Doesn't matter how powerful the nation is or how big the ship is. All of this world is like the Titanic, and the human race on board is heading toward a final accounting before God. See, this particular chapter in Israel's history ought to remind us that since God is the Lord of the universe, well, he has the right to judge you. He has the right to judge me. But he also has the right to justify us, that is, to redeem us, to forgive us through Jesus Christ, his Son. You can defy him and be judged one day, or you can believe him. You can believe his gospel. You can follow his son as your Lord 
and your Savior and be saved from his judgment one day. I, I like to think of it this way. God is navigating human history into the harbor of his sovereign will. So when you meet him, the question is, will you face judgment or will you experience joy? Well, you can experience joy if you've given your life to God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't wait until it's too late. Let me invite you even today to declare he is the Lord. In fact, say it this way, he is my Lord. Well, until next time, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.